so <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, give the floor to Steph, Stephanie Molborn, who's the interim director of the Institute of Behavioral Science, who will give you a well, welcome first. Hi, hi all. I'm Steph. I'm the interim director, and uh, it's great to see such a good turnout and quickly rising as we turn over from a previous talk on a related topic. Um, thanks for being here, everyone, and especially uh, Ruben, thank you for being here. Um, this is such a wonderful honor to be at this lecture. Um, the Institute of Behavioral Science was founded in 1957, and during all of that time and the many years after has been highlighting various kinds of interdisciplinary research, from basic research to applied research, to address the most pressing problems of our times. And it's, uh, this is such a great example of that kind of work. I certainly think we can consider this among the most pressing problems of our times. Our institute has been lucky to have been led for quite a while by distinguished professor Jane Mencken, um, in whose honor this lecture is. And Jane, I don't know if you all can see, she's sitting there smiling. Um, Jane, it's lovely to have you here. Um, and we are very, very happy to have the NIH-funded CU Population Center housed under the Institute's roof, um, who has hosted this lecture. And I'm going to be turning over to the, the Population Center's director, Lori Hunter, who's going to be saying a few more words. Thanks for being here, everyone. Thanks so much, Steph. And yes, I'll echo Steph's welcome to everybody. It's uh, fabulous to see you all here. And sorry, we're not in person, but this is going to be OK. Um, so Jane, can you wave so everybody can see where you are? <laughs> There's Jane. <laughs> Hi, Jane. So I will just, um, I get to introduce Jane. And I'll tell you, we are so blessed to have Professor Jane Megan as a colleague, both in IBS and the Pop Center. Um, I will say a few words about Jane's amazing career. So Jane is a distinguished professor of sociology. Now she's a distinguished research professor past director of the Institute of Behavioral Science. And Jane came to us in 1997 from many distinguished years at the University of Pennsylvania. As part of her very impressive body of population research, she's really focused on fertility um, and she's developed mathematical models of reproduction, carried out studies of the increase in sterility as women age, examined fertility determinants in Bangladesh, as well as teenage pregnancy in the US. Jane continues to be extraordinarily productive and is working on uh, projects on the effects of early life conditions on adult health, especially of women, and the social impact of HIV AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa. Jane's research has been funded by NIA, NIH, um, the Fogarty Center, and a variety of foundations, including Hewlett, Ford, Mellon, and Rockefeller. Jane's contributions to the field of population studies have been recognized across the world and across our nation. Jane was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1989, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1990, uh, the Institute of Medicine in 1995, and she served as the 1985 president of the Population Association of America. In 2009, Jane was honored as the laureate of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population. That's our discipline's great big major international body. And it, meetings are only held every few years. And so this is a, it's a really extraordinary honor. Um, during the awards ceremony, the organization's president described Jane as the great matriarch of demography and the ultimate facilitator of the discipline. And this is actually where I'd like to step away from the CV for a moment, moment and uh, talk a bit more on a personal scale, because Jane is indeed the great matriarch of demography and the ultimate facilitator. So I always love standing in the lobby of the hotel when we get to have our population association meetings uh, in person, which we will someday. I tell you, Jane knows everyone, and everyone knows Jane. And these connections aren't superficial. She really knows everybody and she's made incredible contributions to the careers of so many of them. She uses that network uh, to lift up young scholars. She's tireless in her mentoring. She just walked me through the, the big NIH grant proposal to, um, to get more NIH funding for our center. Um, she's incredible. I benefited from this commitment too early in my career. When I came to see you, Jane introduced me to 
co colleagues in South Africa that I now still collaborate with. And I say that because I'm one of hundreds, if not thousands of people whose career tra tra trajectories Jane really has influenced. So Jane, we're thrilled to offer this lecture in your honor and look forward to many, many, many more years of amazing contributions. Thank you for being who you are and everything that you have done. So I will hand it over now to Fernando Rios Nina. But thank you, Jane. Thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> thank you, Lori. Um, so now it's my, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, the Dr. Ruben Rombaut, who's Distinguished Professor of Sociology at the School of Social Sciences of the, Calif of the University of California, Irvine. Sorry, I'm going to take a little bit because I don't think it would be doing justice to do. I know you, you're here to listen to Ruben, not to listen to me introduce Ruben, but on the one hand, I think that it's, it's, a, it's appropriate and, and useful to give you a little bit of Ruben's uh, background and his influence in the discipline, right? So, uh, Professor Rumba is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Academy of Education, also serving in the General Social Sur Survey Board of Overseers and the Steering Committee of the World Commission on Forced Displacement. In the past, Professor Rumba has also served as an elected member of the Committee on Population at the National Academies and was the founding chair of the Section on International Migration at the American Sociological Association and a founding member of the Committee on International Migration of the Social Science Research Council. These accolades are only a few of many different proofs of Professor Rumbaut's impact on the field of immigration, population studies, and different strands of sociology, of, uh, in, uh, of the sociology of immigration and other, other fields, uh, including race and ethnicity. Uh, Dr. Rumbaut has a long and storied career full of long lasting contributions to the study of the social, political, and policy forces shaping immigration, and as well as the modes of incorporation of immigrants and their descendants to destination society. So he's, he's really a double threat, right? In the sense of studying both what drives immigration in a, in a, a historical comparative perspective to some extent with a very influential textbook, for example, that uh, uh, people still use quite a bit uh, and, and which has had many editions. Uh, as well as a lot of work, including a very long-standing, uh, long-standing longitudinal study of the children of immigrants in uh, in San Diego, for example. Professor Rumba's scholarship has provided insights as to the way in which incorporation in, for example, health or educational outcomes, to name to name a couple of uh, the, the two most important, I think, that he has looked at, of different immigrant groups, are shaped by the context of immigration and reception. His talk today will provide an overview of how U.S. federal policies in recent years, a major component of that context of reception, and which also shapes the context of emigration and even return for migrants to be and prior migrants respectively, have evolved, and how they relate to historical practice of inclusion and exclusion in U.S. immigration. Given the relevance of the impacts of these measures today and for years to come, we could not think of a better scholar to discuss this issue. So thank you again, Ruben, for uh, doing this. Well, thank you, for, uh, Fernando, for that very generous uh, introduction. And uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm speaking to you from my home in California. Uh, I don't know where all of you are. I know many of you are in Colorado, but I take it that uh, we have an audience uh, uh, that may reach from coast to coast. I am uh, grateful and honored for the invitation to give this lecture named in Jane Mencken's honor on in population studies, the nativist reaction to immigration in the United States, focusing on the forging of what I will call the great exclusion of the four years of the Trump administration, framing it in the context of the history of immigrant America, and mindful of the fact that voting is already underway for a critical election 25 days from now, arguably the most consequential, chaotic, and Kafkaesque election in our lifetimes, and one in which the great exclusion is on the ballot. As you can see from the uh, first slide, um, I've entitled the talk, The Wall, American Nativism, Immigration Policy and the Great Exclusion of 2017-2020. And slide two, I uh, begin with this epigraph, uh, it's a verse from Walt Whitman, uh, which I thought 
particularly apt for what is decidedly not a linear story. Do I contradict myself? Ask Whitman. Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Slide three. An iconic feature of the American experience and of the American narrative <clears throat> has been the remarkable capacity of this self-professed nation of immigrants to absorb, like a giant global sponge, tens of millions of newcomers from all classes and cultures and countries. In American myth, uh, immigration history is portrayed as a bumpy but mostly linear story of progress toward the city upon the hill, a liberal narrative of American nationalist exceptionalism with the United States as a beacon of hope for the world and the Statue of Liberty, as you can see in this iconic uh, image, as a mother of exiles wor welcoming the tempest tossed, lifting her lamp beside the golden door. Uh, this is an iconic uh, image of immigrants arriving from Europe sailing past the Statue of Liberty. And slide four, uh, Fernando is another iconic image of immigrants on Ellis Island looking toward the Statue of Liberty. You can remove the slides now. Uh, but this phenomenal accomplishment has historically coexisted with a senior side of the process of nation building, expansion, and design. Much of American history can be framed as a dialectic of processes of inclusion and exclusion and in extreme cases of expulsions and forced removals. Those processes may occur simultaneously, uh, but one or the other tend to dominate over periods of time. Indeed, this country was founded on two horrific great exclusions and expulsions. First, slavery, what has been called the country's original sin, and the system of caste segregation that followed for a century after the failure of reconstruction a first attempt at a great inclusion after the Civil War, together with the 13th, 14th, and 15th uh, amendments to the constitutions. And second, the decimation and forced removals from their own land of the indigenous population of the continent, what I have called the country's aboriginal sin. Immigration is followed predictably, not only by adaptations shaping the immigrants' most of incorporation, but also by state policies that seek to control migration flows and by different forms of reaction on the part of established residents and politicians who may welcome the newcomers or see them as alien cultural, economic, political, or security threats and react, especially when a moral panic is catalyzed by demagogues, amplified by mass media, and acted upon by the machinery of state control to forge modes of excorporation. In slide five, in Philadelphia, in 1751, 25 years before he signed the Declaration of Independence, future founding father, Benjamin Franklin, famously railed against the, the Germans whom he called Palatine Boers, as you can see in this famous quotation, warning that soon they will become a colony of aliens so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion." Unquote. Back then, when not even Germans were imagined to be white, the mixing of racism and nativism was already becoming a familiar, habitual American blend. You can remove the slide. More than a quarter of a millennium after Franklin issued his famous warning, the fear of the foreigner, the xenophobia of what has been called the society of contempt has been variously rising in tandem with all forms of international migrations, not only in the United States, but in Europe and elsewhere, exacerbated by global economic crises, terrorist attacks, wars, refugee flows, and now a global pandemic shaping the rise of today's anti-immigration populists. But what is happening today is far from new in the American experience. History may not repeat itself, but it echoes. As illustrated in the following 10 slides, which I'll go in fairly quick order, uh, the current moment harkens back to earlier national periods of exclusion and expulsion. 
in this slide, for example, to the know-nothings of the mid-19th century and their virulent anti-Catholicism. In slide seven, to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the year before Emma Lazarus uh, penned her poem welcoming the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, which was inscribed years later on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. Slide eight, this is an 1886 political cartoon. Uncle Sam is holding a bottle of, it's called Magic Washer, and kicking a Chinese man off a cliff as others flee to the sea. The caption says, the Chinese must go. The 1882 Chinese exclusion was later massively extended to the so-called Asiatic bar zone of 1917, which prohibited immigrants from any Asian country not owned by the United States. That is, to all but the Philippines, which was then a US colony. Slide nine, it also harkens back to the decades long nativist animus against Southern and Eastern Europeans as captured in this 1891 political cartoon, which is entitled, Where the Blame Lies. A glimpse into the moral panic of those times, it shows Uncle Sam looking down disapprovingly upon newly arriving immigrants. It portrays them as dangerous, threatening, as criminals or paupers with different languages and political beliefs, willing to work for much lower wages. Note that in the cartoon at right, you can see Castle Garden, which is where immigrants arriving in New York were then processed, including Donald Trump's grandfather, Friedrich, in 1885 at age 16. Ellis Island would not open uh, till a year later in 1892. Uh, but as you can see, the Statue of Liberty had already been dedicated in 1886 um, in New York Harbor, as seen in the drawing. Slide 10. Nonetheless, immigrants kept coming to the United States during this era of industrialization. The first decade of the 20th century set records uh, for immigration to the United States with 1907 the peak year. It took until the decade of the 1990s before those record numbers were superseded. In slide 11, another political car cartoon, this one is from 1910. It's entitled, The Immigrant. Is he an acquisition or a detriment? This is a more nuanced cartoon, and in it, different perspectives uh, on immigration are personified. You may not be able to read the fine print, but uh, I'll just kind of summarize it for you. Uncle Sam on the left is looking for hard workers to fill the nation's factories. The political boss, once the immigrant vote. The contractor is looking for cheap labor. The health inspector uh, at right, it worries that immigrants carry contagious diseases. The worker fears lowered wages because immigrants were willing to work for less. And finally, the middle-class man claims the new immigrants are a menace because they represent inferior European races and religions. In slide 12, uh, the early 20th century also saw the rise of the eugenics movement and of the popularization of scientific racism, including these two influential um, books of the period. The first on the left, uh, published in 1916, The Passing of the Great Race or The Racial Basis of European History by Madison Grant. He was an American eugenicist and amateur anthropologist who expounded a theory of Nordic superiority. It has been described as the manifesto of scientific racism. Grant's usage of the te term Nordic race was embraced by the Klan and admired by Hitler. And then on the right, published in 1920, is the book The Rising Tide of Color, The Threat Against Wide World Supremacy by Lothrop Stoddard, a Harvard PhD who predicted the collapse of white world empire and colonialism because the population growth of non-white peoples and because of rising nationalism in colonized nations. Stoddard advocated restrictions uh, on non-white migration into white nations and warned against miscegenation. I might say as an aside that a century later in 2018, President Trump referred to countries from Africa, Haiti, and El Salvador as, quote, shithole countries, and said that he preferred immigrants from countries like Norway 
alas, uh, only a few hundred Norwegians immigrate to the U.S. Uh, each year. Far more Americans from the U.S. immigrate to Norway. Slide 13. Um, recall also the anti-German hysteria of World War I, the post-World War I Red Scare, and the Palmer Raids. This 1919 political cartoon is titled The World's Melting Pot, and at the very top it says, we can't digest the scum. And note the captions of what's inside the pot. IWW, International Workers of the World, Anarchy, Un-American Ideals, Mad Notions of Europe, Bolshevism, and Red Flag. The Ku Klux Klan at the time uh, saw the failure of the melting pot as, quote, the primary position of the Klan, which brings us to slide 14. The Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s, uh, also known as the Second Klan, became the largest social movement of the early 20th century. That's something that's not fully appreciated. Uh, it claimed up to 6 million members and many more millions of followers nationwide. The Second Klan elected 11 governors, 45 congressmen, and hundreds of state, county, and municipal officials. Its biggest legislative triumph was the Restrictionist and Blatantly Racist National Origins Quota Act of 1924, also known as the Johnson Reed Act. Congressman Albert Johnson, the main sponsor of the act, was a Klan member. Particularly prominent was the Klan's widespread use of the America First slogan, as you can see in this march of, of tens of thousands in Washington, D.C. In in around 1924, and their version of, quote, 100% Americanism. The Klan added Catholics and Jews to its enemies list and built on fear of immigrants. It defined itself as an ultra, as ultra patriotic. Uh, it labeled white Protestants as the only true 100% Americans and was dedicated to, quote, making America great again, unquote. We can be done with this slide. <clears throat> Subsequent spasms of exclusion and expulsion would follow, including the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II and the repatriation and forced removals during the Great Depression of the 1930s of about a million Mexican Americans, over half of whom were US citizens, representing an estimated one third of the total Mexican American population in the US at the time. And another million during so-called Operation Wetback in 1954 in the middle of the Bracero probe. In slide 15, um, to kind of sum this all up, uh, we come to a 2011 political cartoon drawn a century later, which sums up in a nutshell this 240 year uh, history of American nativism and exclusion of Papists, uh, Catholics, uh, immigrants of Chinese, Jews, Mexicans over the century. The caption, as you can see at the bottom, says history marches on, nativism marches in place. And if you note the small print in the four panels of, uh, of the cartoon from 1780 to now, the caption mentions a wall. It calls for a wall from we must erect a wall of brass around the country for the exclusion of Catholics, that first one, to now where it says we should erect a wall against Mexicans. Uh, exit from the slide. Still, uh, so as not to make this too much of a tale of war, there has been a period in American history which has stood out as a great inclusion. Comparatively, uh, as I've argued, the most inclusive era in American immigration history, certainly when focused on the governmental context of reception at the federal level, spanning approximately the quarter century from 1965 to 1990. Immigrants and refugees during this great inclusion benefited from first the, the 1965 Immigration Act, whose chief strength was its appeal to the egalitarian in the spirit to egalitarianism in the spirit of the civil rights movement of the 1960s and its repeal of the racist immigration law that had been in place for decades. Uh, in fact, the 55th anniversary of its enactment was marked just five days ago on October 3rd. 
Uh, second, the resettlement of hundreds of thousands of Cold War refugees from Cuba after the 1959 revolution, and even more uh, from Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia after the end of the Indochina War in 1975, for whom the U.S. assumed the historic responsibility. Also, the passage of the Refugee Act of 1980, which finally conformed U.S. law with the United Nations definition of refugee. 1980 was the peak year of U.S. refugee resettlement in U.S. history, and more refugees were resettled in the U.S. during the decade of the 1980s than in any other. Uh, also, the amnesty provisions of the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, IRCA, which legalized the status of 2.7 million undocumented immigrants, and the tripling of immigrant visas to the highly skilled by the 1990 Immigration Act. You turn to slide 16, that this chart portrays the size and percent share of the foreign-born population of the U.S. from 1850 to about five years ago, across the same span of time that I have been just quickly reviewing. Note the following in particular. The great European migration of 1880 to the 1920s peaked in 1890 and again in 1910 when 14.7% of the population was foreign born. In 1910, that was 13.5 million immigrants. And then it slowed with the onset of World War I um, and the Russian Revolution. And it was followed by a period of retrenchment um, with immigration declining after the passage of the aforementioned uh, restrictive national origin quota laws of the 1920s and then just plummeting with the onset of the Great Depression, followed by World War II. It reached a historic nadir in 1970, as you can see at the, at the bottom of the blue line, when only 4.7% of the U.S. population was foreign born. At that point, immigration then began a sharp increase, accelerating over the period that spans the Great Inclusion and that extends into the 21st century. By 2010, the American Community Survey counted a foreign-born population of 40 million, a then historic high, quadrupling uh, since 1970, when it stood at 9.6 million people, foreign-born. In 2010, the foreign-born comprised 12.9% uh, of the total population, a share not yet at the levels reached from 1860 to 1920, as you see, but nonetheless growing. By 2015, the foreign-born numbered over 43 million for a 13.5% share of the population. And then if you look at slide 17, also by 2015, this chart shows the 10 countries with the largest foreign-born populations in the U.S. in 2015. Five were from Latin America and five from Asia. A century earlier, from the 1880s to the 1920s, the nativist reaction had been triggered by the shift of immigration from Northern and Western Europe to Southern and Eastern Europe. In the current era of immigration since 1970, the shift in national origins has been to immigrants from Latin America and Asia. Those top 10 countries accounted for nearly 60% of the total immigration of 43.3 uh, million people uh, to the United States, the total number of immigrants in uh, 2015. Mexico alone, as you see for that blue slice of the pie chart, accounted for 26.9% of the total foreign born in 2015, although that share was notably down from 29% in 2010 and 2011. Uh, it had been going down especially significantly after the 2007-2009 Great Recession um, and losing about a million people, uh, immigrants especially uh, undocumented. And then um, the other four Latin American countries are in the slides there that you see are El Salvador, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Guatemala in that order. Together, those five Latin American countries total nearly 40% of the foreign born. And then from Asia, the top five countries of origin are now India, China, which in this chart includes Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, and South Korea, which combined account for over 20% of the total foreign born population. Exit the slide, please. And yet uh, to that, 
relative great inclusion of 1965 to 1990, another revanchist backlash of exclusion and expulsion was to follow. In 1984, here in California, the anti-immigrant proposition 187 passed in a landslide, although it was a judge unconstitutional and never implemented, in, nevertheless would influence uh, other nativist efforts at the federal, state, and local level. And also in 1994, Republicans took over Congress for the first time in decades. Today's deportation nation, as it has come to be called, has been forged by the militarization of the border and the criminalization of immigrants, the passage of draconian federal laws in 1996, which greatly expanded the categories of deportable offenses, an immense formidable and well-funded machinery for immigrant detention and deportation, which was greatly expanded and funded after the attacks and moral panic of 9-11, which saw the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security and ICE and the removal of the word naturalization from INS. I always loved that word, naturalization. Uh, and a sprawling gulag of hundreds of mostly for-profit detention centers where in some years over 400,000 immigrants have been detained annually. In addition, there's been the paralysis of any meaningful federal comprehensive uh, reform legislation since 1990, including the DREAM Act, which was actually introduced before 9-11 and nothing has come of it, and the proliferation of hundreds of state and local laws and ordinances seeking to control immigration at the local level despite constitutional mandates to the contrary. Ironically, President Obama, who entered office in 2009 on campaign promises of comprehensive immigration reform, left office having presided over the largest number of deportations in American history, three million. And then came Trump. When the Republican Party issued an autopsy report after losing the 2012 election to President Obama, it called for openness to Hispanics and to back comprehensive immigration reform, as the so-called Gang of Eight would soon try to do in the Senate. But then citizen Donald Trump called that a death wish for the Republicans, ridiculing Mitt Romney's campaign and warning that allowing 11 million illegal immigrants to gain citizenship would be suicidal since they would all vote for Democrats. He had already been stoking the Burther lie about President Obama and seeing his popularity skyrocket among hardcore Republican primary voters. Immigration would be a way to weave the Burther theme into a legitimate campaign platform by talking bluntly about the evils of immigration to voters deeply anxious about people who looked and sounded different than themselves. What would become the rhetorical core of Trump's anti-immigration screed, the wall, was actually stumbled upon as a gimmick, a mnemonic, um, which in two speeches early in 2015, he found was a hit with the crowd. A month before he came down the escalator in Trump Tower to officially announce his, his candidacy uh, for the presidency in June 2015, he said this to an ultra-conservative political group, quote, See if it sounds familiar. Mexicans are pouring illegals and cheap cars across the border like so much vomit. These are people, and some are very fine, I'm sure, but they're sending their killers, their rapists, their murderers, their drug lords. One thing I can tell you, I'm a great builder. I would build the greatest wall that anybody's ever seen, believe me. There was enthusiastic hooting and a sustained round of applause. Trump was hooked. The wall became a permanent part of his message. And you always remember was on slides 18. These are Trump's words at Trump Tower on June 16, 2015, announcing uh, that he was running for president. I don't need to repeat that. You can exit that, uh, Fernando. Makes me sick every time I see it. With the election of 2016, the United States embarked on an uncertain, inglorious era with the improbable rise to power of a demagogue 
who began his campaign for the presidency in 2015 by falsely attacking Mexican immigrants as criminals and rapists, postponed, uh, proposing the construction of a wall along its southern border, which Mexico is going to pay for, the ending of birthright citizenship, which has been a hallmark of US constitutional law since the end of the Civil War, the establishment of a Muslim registry, the reduction of refugee resettlement, and outright denial of refuge to entire nationalities like Syrians, federal defunding of sanctuary cities, and vast increases in immigrant detention and deportations from already record highs. As Musafur Shishti of uh, the Migration Policy Institute put it recently, referring to Trump, quote, we have never had a president who ran and won on immigration. And moreover, a nativist for whom immigration is zero sum. What is good for immigrants is bad for America. Immigration is foreign. And as such, it is the antithesis of America first. This newspaper front page headline uh, came out right after Trump's inaugural on January 20, 2017, America first. Um, here's a, a, a quote uh, from his inaugural address. From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. After running one of the most racially and ethnically divisive campaigns in American history, Trump recited a fearful litany, gangs, drugs, crime, foreigners, and he told the nation, quote, this American carnage stops right here and stops right now, promising to, quote, make America great again. And how, uh, with respect to immigration, was he going to make America great again? Well, look at this headline in slide 20. Despite his campaign rhetoric about the wall on the Mexican border, Trump quickly called for cutting legal immigration by half ending family reunification, he calls it chain migration, eliminating the visa lottery, and restricting immigrants via a merit system, a proposal that has been called, as you see in the slide, quote, the most racist immigration policy since the Ku Klux Klan effectively wrote its whites-only views onto the National Origins Quota Act of 1924. That's that slide. Uh, you can exit from that. Trump's efforts to undo the existing immigration system um, has been carried out entirely through hundreds of executive orders and presidential directives over the past 45 months. No legislation has been passed dealing with immigration in these last four years. And yet, consider just, just some of what has been attempted and done to date, at the end of which I will provide some new data release uh, just days ago to put in perspective the impact it has had, and then I will briefly conclude. Within his first year in office, uh, he issued executive orders on sanctuary cities, the border wall, the Muslim travel bans 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. He rescinded Obama's DAPA and then DACA and set the end date, i.e. eliminated, temporary protective status uh, programs for hundreds of thousands of recipients, including over 200,000 from El Salvador, over 50,000 from Haiti, and many more from a dozen other countries. In the first uh, months after his inauguration, ICE arrests in the interior of the country jumped by 42%, which interestingly was almost the same exact percentage by which the two largest private prison companies in the US saw their stock valuations rise in the New York Stock Exchange just on the day after the election. Then in January 2020, this year, an expanded travel ban, called it Travel Ban 4.0, was announced, adding six more countries to the list of those who can no longer obtain visas, allowing them to immigrate to the US permanently or to participate in the diversity visa lottery which for many Africans is the only way they can immigrate to the US. Those six countries are Nigeria, Eritrea, Sudan, Tanzania, Myanmar, and Kyrgyzstan. The March uh, 2017 travel ban 3.0, after two failed bans, which had been a total Muslim ban, the 3.0 uh, had barred citizens from seven countries from entering the US with immigrant or non-immigrant visas. 
Iran, Syria, Yemen, Libya, Somalia, Venezuela, and North Korea. Those last two, Venezuela and North Korea, were added to include non-Muslim cases and hence make it palatable to the courts. The number of visas granted to citizens of the first five countries I mentioned fell by 80% from 2016 to 2018. In effect, the travel bans resurrected the national origin quotas of the 1920s that Congress sought to repeal in 1965. The Trump administration has also redefined and expanded the meaning of the 19th century term public charge to use as grounds for excluding legal immigrants from citizenship if they, or even a US born child, for example, a child with a disability, has ever used such public programs as the food stamps or even Obamacare or tax credits as a means of cutting legal immigration sharply, especially family reunification, so-called chain migration. Uh, early this year, the Supreme Court expedited a decision allowing the public charge rule to go into effect nationwide, even while multiple challenges were working their way through the lower courts. The rule requires immigration officials essentially to predict the future about whether someone is likely at any time to use public benefits. It operates like a wealth test, plus also discriminates against people with disabilities and those who don't speak English. Uh, the rule uh, was expected to block hundreds of thousands of immigrants each year from obtaining a visa or a green card. The National Foundation for American Policy predicted that one of the most severe drops would come in the category of immediate relatives of U.S. citizens, a 47% drop from the 567,000 in fiscal 2016 to 299,000 in fiscal 2021. The rule they predicted would have its biggest effects on countries Trump regularly attacks, those from Africa and the Caribbean, effectively imposing, again, if indirectly, a pseudo national origins quota via wealth test that goes back a century to when Congress aimed to keep out undesirables. And then came the pandemic. Just this June, June 2020, Trump extended a near total ban on entry into the U.S. by immigrants seeking green cards, a policy, uh, a near total ban, a policy that has been called, quote, the most sweeping ban on immigration in American history on grounds of preventing the spread of the coronavirus and, quote, protecting American workers from wage competition, although neither rationale can justify such sweeping restrictions on virtually all immigrants seeking to settle here permanently. The ban was then further expanded to cover H-1B visas as well as other temporary employment visas. Recall that after 9-11, the former Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS, was split into an enforcement arm, ICE and CBP, and USCIS, as United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. The word naturalization having been removed from its name as I mentioned earlier. Trump's USCIS went further, removing the phrase, quote, America's promise as a nation of immigrants from its mission statement and replacing it with a statement of its role as, quote, administering a lawful immigration system while protecting Americans and securing the homeland. Not as poetic as a America's promise as a nation of immigrants. Since 2016, an enormous backlog of citizenship applications has formed, growing by over 93% with unexplained delays in processing them. Lawful permanent residents, LPRs, have been waiting as long as 20 months for their citizenship applications to be processed. At the current rate, one estimate has suggested that it would take USCIS over 25 years to get back down to the Obama administration's backlog level of 380,000 applications in 2015, and that's assuming no new applications. In effect, USCIS, with this backlog, is preventing lawful eligible immigrants from becoming naturalized. In 2018, USCIS um, also formed a denaturalization task force, and then earlier this year, a denaturalization section was formally established within the Department of Justice, putting on notice uh, for naturalized U.S. citizens 
that their status may no longer be guaranteed. Now, a few words on refugees. This is the cover of the 2020 report of UNHCR Global Trends on Forced Displacement in 2019, which as you can see, uh, indicates that at the end of 2019, December 2019, there were 79.5 million people forcibly displaced from their homes, including refugees, 26 million, uh, asylum seekers internally displaced, uh, the stateless. If you go on to the next slide, Fernando, um, you can see there the global trends in forced displacement from 2010 at the bottom all the way up to 2019 at the top. As I mentioned, uh, in 2019, um, there were approximately 80 million people who were forcibly displaced, and that essentially doubles the numbers from 2010 and 2011 uh, of about uh, 40 million forcibly uh, displaced people. The number of uh, forcibly displaced persons, refugees, and so on has been skyrocketing uh, over this uh, decade. And uh, if you turn to slide 23, please, um, you can see how for the United States, how has, how has the United States responded to this uh, crisis? Well, this graph shows refugee admissions and annual settlement uh, resettlement ceilings. The ceiling is the blue bar. The number of actual uh, refugee admissions is the, the orange uh, bar. Um, from 1980, when the Refugee Act was passed, uh, all the way to 2020, uh, to, to the present. Um, the United States uh, had successfully resettled over 3 million refugees since 1975. In fiscal 2017, the refugee ceiling was 110,000. But Trump cut it by half to 53,000, with actual admissions uh, less than that. Um, uh, in fact, during that year, Trump issued an executive order suspending all refugee admissions for 120 days. Then in fiscal 2017, uh, for the first time in history, the U.S. resettled fewer refugees than the rest of the world. In fiscal 2018, the ceiling was reduced to 45,000. Although, as you can see there, only 22,000 were actually admitted. Uh, and that was done by deliberately slowing down, slowing down the vetting process. That year, Canada surpassed the United States in resettling refugees. And in fiscal 2019, the annual ceiling was lowered to 30,000. And then in fiscal 2020, uh, which just ended in September uh, 30, the ceiling was lowered still further to 18,000. Both are the lowest levels since the Refugee Act of 1980 was passed. Actual admissions for this fiscal year 2020 will almost certainly fall far short of the ceiling uh, because of new restrictions imposed due to COVID-19. Slide 24, this chart spells out actual refugee ceilings and admissions from 2009 to 2020. Note the precipitous drop in both ceilings and admissions for the years of the Great Exclusion, 2017 to 2020. And then, please, uh, to slide 25. Uh, this is a New York Times front page story from just last week, October 1, um, reporting, one, that the Trump administration's uh, latest cuts to the U.S. refugee resettlement ceiling for 2021 was a mere 15,000 rock bottom territory despite the skyrocketing global refugee crisis. And second, Trump's continual xenophobic attacks on refugees during a rally in Minnesota last Wednesday. It was the day after the so-called debate and the day before he tested positive for COVID, in which he again demonized Somali refugees in Minnesota, warning that, quote, Biden has a plan to inundate your state with a historic flood of refugees coming from the most dangerous places in the world, like Yemen, Syria, and your favorite country, Somalia, right? Biden will turn your state into a refugee camp. And he again singled out one of the nation's most prominent refugees, most prominent Somali refugees, Minnesota Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, who won her district in 2018 with 78% of the vote, a district that is 65% white. And Trump says, quote, 
She tells us how to run our country. Can you believe it? How the hell did Minnesota elect her? What the hell is wrong with you people, right? What the hell happened? He was in his element back to his nativist playbook as he had done throughout the 2016 campaign and in the 2018 midterms. In September 2019, Trump issued yet another executive order requiring for the first time uh, states to affirmatively opt in if they want to receive newly arriving refugees. 42 states, including 19 with Republican governors and more than 100 mayors announced that they would indeed continue to host refugees, a move that caught the White House by surprise. Only Texas went along with Trump, although the governor, Governor Abbott, was sharply rebuked by the mayors of Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. <clears throat> Few words on asylum. Uh, by 2018, the asylum system in the United States had reached a crisis point, both affirmative, the uh, U.S. Uh, CIS, and defensive in immigration courts and removal proceedings. Asylum systems have extensive backlogs, uh, approximately one million cases and growing. The Trump administration uh, actions leading to this include narrowing access to humanitarian protections, eliminating gang and domestic violence as grounds for asylum, under the uh, <clears throat> uh, fear of persecution. And most infamously, the policy, as you will remember, that was first secretly tested in the El Paso sector, starting in October 2017, and then formally unveiled by Attorney General Jeff Sessions in April 2018, dubbed Zero Tolerance. The plan vowed criminal pr prosecution of all migrants caught crossing between border posts, even though they were coming to turn themselves into the first uniform officer to ask for asylum. Um, uh, so even for families seeking asylum. And uh, the action made um, uh, child separation official policy uh, because children can't be housed in criminal detention. Since they were being criminalized, people who had been previously handled in, in civil proceedings were suddenly placed in this predicament. Uh, Session said, quote, if you don't want your child separated, then don't bring them across the border illegally. Since October, authorities have seized, unbeknownst to the, the nation, several thousand children, including infants and toddlers, and sent them to foster homes in states as far flung as New York and Michigan, leaving their frantic incarcerated parents trying to figure out where they were. Many parents were deported without their kids. Many people across the United States were dismayed by the wanton malice of it all. The American Academy of Pediatrics denounced a sweeping cruelty and warned that taking children from their parents could inflict lifelong harm. As the outrage mounted, Trump characteristically lied and called family separation a Democrat policy and added, quote, the Democrats don't care about crime and want illegal immigrants no matter how bad they may be, to pour into and infest our country. He called them animals. Sessions and Sarah Huckabee Sanders quoted the Bible. On Fox, Ann Coulter, uh, Ann Coulter suggested the wailing children were child actors, and Laura Ingram defended juvenile detention centers as essentially summer camps. Many of the kids were, the kids were effectively in cages. After a federal judge ordered the families reunited, chaos reigned as officials tried to identify and return children, in some cases after having destroyed vital records. It became clear that the government had made no plans for their reunification. The refugee office within the Department of Health and Human Services, which was told to facilitate the reunification, found that the office database did not have a column for families that had been so separated. It didn't have a designation. So caseworkers and government health officials had to sift by hand the files of nearly 12,000 immigrant children in HHS custody. And in the end, they did not have a distinct classification for more than 2,000 children who had been taken from their families. So the agents had to come up with a new term. They called them, quote, deleted family units. Hundreds of children remained separated to date and may have become permanently orphaned. 
this Kafkaesque episode, which has been likened to child abuse, torture, kidnapping, and a crime against humanity, marked a major escalation in Trump's efforts to halt immigration and punish immigrants. You turn to the next slide. Uh, these are two impactful pictures that I'm sure most of you must have seen that went around the world worth much more than a thousand words. The top photo from September 2015 is a lifeless body of a three-year-old boy, one of at least 12 Syrians who drowned attempting to reach the Greek island of Kos. His name was Alan Kurdi. His five-year-old brother also met a similar death after two boats carrying a total of 23 people capsized. As of 2015, over 5.5 million people had been displaced in Syria alone since the war began. Today, that number is 6.6 .6 million displaced Syrians. Hardly any of them have been resettled in the United States. And the bottom photo from June 2019 is of a Salvadoran father and daughter drowned trying to cross the Rio Grande into Texas. The image shows uh, Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez, 26, and his daughter Valeria lying face down in shallow water. The 23-month-old toddler's arm is wrapped around her father's neck, clinging to him in her final moments. And now, uh, these are two time covers during the 2018 summer of the zero tolerance and family separation policy. They speak for themselves. Uh, you can exit the, the slide, Fernando. In early 2019, the Trump administration rolled out a new policy requiring people applying for asylum at the border to wait in Mexico while their claims for uh, protection were being reviewed, a process that often takes months uh, or even years. Since then, uh, some 60,000 asylum seekers have been turned back by U.S. authorities into Mexican border cities where violence and kidnappings have surged. Shelters in Mexico are scant and overrun, and most of the migrants are living in vast tent encampments exposed to the elements and Mexican cartels, and now most recently to a global pandemic. This policy is formally known as MPP, Mexican Protection Protocols, or quote, remain in Mexico. Although it has done just the opposite, uh, of protecting vulnerable people who have instead been put in harm's way. Federal law requires safeguarding people fleeing persecution abroad, not banishing them to perilous conditions in a different place. Uh, we're running out of time and there's so much more that I haven't touched on, but the end result is that Trump and his political advisors, notably Stephen Miller, who's the architect of his immigration policies, believe that the largely successful effort to seal off the country from asylum seekers and refugees fleeing persecution, war, and violence remains a winning campaign issue for next month's election. Now, what has been the impact of all of this on the size and growth of immigrant America? Slide 28 um, <clears throat> uh, provides a statistical snapshot, if you will, of the great exclusion in those three blue bars at the end of the chart. The chart is essentially the same one that I had shown earlier, uh, about 15 slides ago, but now it brings the story up to 2019. Newly released uh, census data just came out, reveal that from 2010 to 2020, the nation's foreign born population will experience the smallest growth for any decade since the 1970s. American Community Survey data through 2019 uh, shows that even before COVID-19 hit, foreign-born gains plummeted during the first three years of the Trump presidency, 2017, 2018, and 2019. The foreign-born share of the U.S. population has remained constant. If you can go back to the previous slide for a moment, uh, it remained constant at 13.7% uh, for each year. It never uh, increased like it had been since uh, 1970. Uh, and by the end of the pandemic year of, of 2020, the numbers will decline further still. In fact, the year 2020 will be the first uh, in half a century since 1970 to register a decline in the percent of the population that is foreign born. 
um, just exit the slides. And let me just say uh, a few words by word of conclusion. The hostility to migrants um, uh, has grown since Trump took office. His presidency has been called a study in venom. After nearly four years of a shock and awe approach to immigration policy, oscillating between farce and tragedy, from the chaos at airports nationwide caused by the very first ill-considered travel bans of early 2017, to the nativist rally in Minnesota last week, I would like to return to the totem of his presidency, the wall. Trump has been obsessed about his wall throughout, and it remains a top applause line at his rallies. But he was flummoxed by a Congress that refused to authorize the billions that he demanded for his project, at times ranging in design from cement ballers to steel slats. Um, at one point over a year ago, he shut down the government, you might recall, for 35 days, the longest in history, in an effort to extort the money from Congress. He then declared a national emergency as, a, as an effort to, to, uh, to, to force uh, Congress to provide the money. And after the House and the Senate rejected it, he vetoed Congress and has been siphoning funds authorized by Congress for other purposes to build his wall. And how much of the wall has been built? Well, as of August 2020, this is the last number I got, only five miles of new wall quote, 30 foot high steel baller fencing had been constructed, plus another 255 miles of repairs to existing fencing. None of it paid for by Mexico. In fact, at one point in January of this year, part of the wall in California under construction fell into the Mexican side as a result of high winds. I guess they couldn't dodge that draft. Still, considering what has been done, to severely restrict immigration and punish immigrants these last four years. President Trump may have gotten his wall after all. The Trump presidency will pass, as will, it is to be hoped, this era of a great expulsion. But who knows how deep the damage done may be, nor how long it may endure, nor how long it may take to repair, not the wall, but the world. The past is prologue, yes, but it doesn't have to be the epilogue too. Besides, if past this prologue, we're about due for another great inclusion. But magical thinking won't make it so any more than it will make the coronavirus disappear one day like a miracle. Don't wait for Godot. Vote. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Ruben. Excellent presentation. Uh, so if people have questions, please drop them in the chat, but we can try as well to have a couple of, you know, if you have a quick question, I would just ask you to be brief in the interest of time. Uh, you can also speak up if that's easier, uh, whatever you prefer. But uh, yeah, we can, we can also um, manage the questions on the chat as well. So whatever you prefer. Uh, people are are saying in the chat, Ruben, because uh, Professor Rumba cannot cannot see the chat uh, from his iPad, but um, very easily. But it says great presentation. Uh, thanks, Ruben, incisive and moving as always, uh, by El Braimo and David Cook Martin, respectively. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names, by the way. I just learned that David joined you guys at the University of Colorado Boulder last year. Thank so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear from, from David. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah, and we have, we have uh, at, at some point, we had 95 people. And, and there's a group from the University of Texas, San Antonio as well, by the way, uh, Professor Rene Centeno's class. I believe Professor, G, Professor Jim Walsh's class at UC Denver was here as well, um, and several other, other folks from the university and, and beyond. Uh, including one of some of your colleagues from Irvine, like Eddie Tejas, for example. Very happy to, very happy. Eddie's still in Santa Barbara, uh, although he joined our oh. department uh, this year. But physically, we're all having to do things like what I'm doing now. I, I hadn't even heard of Zoom, you know, 
until uh, Friday the 13th of March <laughs> when UCI became a ghost town overnight. We were told that we had two weeks to learn to teach classes online. Uh, I never taught a uh, class online before. And I had to do it all with an iP a little iPad from home. I'm still doing it in an iPad from home. But uh, look at the silver lining. So many people from so many other places are able to access the talk, uh, which would not have been the case if we had done this in person at Boulder. All right, yeah, we, yeah we're appreciative of, of everybody who, who came, especially if you came from elsewhere, but, uh, or uh, colleagues from elsewhere uh, in that sense as well. Um, we have we have a, a series of questions already pouring in, so let me start with with a few. Uh, Professor Ming, Ming Su Shen from the law school uh, here at, at CU asks, "What should the priorities be for repairing immigration policy in the coming years?" Oh my goodness! Um, to think of a priority over another priority is is almost. Uh, uh, a misplaced focus because so much has to be done on so many fronts. You just heard me talk about the, the refugee issue and refugee resettlement, the horrendous uh, crisis of asylum uh, at the border, what has been done to legal immigration. Um, I didn't even get to talk about forced hysterectomies in, in ICE detention facilities and uh, sending Guatemalan uh, deportees back to Guatemala who were infected with COVID. Uh, and then started an outbreak once they, they got to Guatemala. I mean, there, there's so much uh, that has to be done um, in each of all these different buckets. Uh, nothing short of truly comprehensive immigration reform with a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, um, uh, not just DACA, not just the DREAM Act. Um, that is how the great inclusion came to be. All this all these, as I call them, zombie ideas that immigrants bring crime and rapists and diseases and everything to, to the country. If that were the case, the United States would have become a failed state back in the 19th century uh, and not the, the, the only superpower on earth. Uh, California has 40 million people. 27% of them are immigrants and another 25% are children of immigrants. So 52% of California our immigrants or their children. Um, the greatest number of Mexican immigrants, Salvadorans, Guatemalans, Iranians, uh, Taiwanese, I can go on and on and on and on and on, Filipinos are found here in California, Armenians. Um, if immigrants are uh, the zero sum that uh, Trump uh, posits, you would think that California would have fallen into the sea already. Instead, uh, two years ago, California passed the UK to become the world's fifth largest economy. Crime rates are down to historic lows, both violent crimes and property crimes. Um, and California is a multi-ethnic, thriving um, um, experiment, if you will, um, in which people feel that they're part of the mainstream. Uh, I've interviewed hundreds of um, immigrants and, and children of refugees who say, oh, I, I feel like I'm part of the American mainstream here. But if I were to go to Texas or to Florida, said one Vietnamese uh, respondent, uh, they would look at me like I was an alien. It has to do with how you forge a great inclusion. Uh, and it's not just a matter uh, I mean, of prioritizing this element or that element, or, but, but attempting a comprehensive solution. It can be done. It must uh, be done. But I wouldn't attempt it to do it piecemeal. But to achieve that, you have to achieve it politically. You cannot achieve it with a Senate that's under Republican control, divided governance, um, let alone uh, an executive uh, that uh, will undermine uh, every effort. You need a Supreme Court that will uh, call strikes uh, and not just stack up, uh, start, for example, uh, avoiding uh, the, for all intents and purposes, the, the Voting Rights Act, et cetera, et cetera. You need a combined effort of federal, executive, legislative, and judicial branches to really work together uh, to force this great inclusion. And it cannot be done also only at the federal level. As I mentioned along the way, a lot has to be done at the state and local levels as well. The context of reception has to be reset altogether. 
Thank you. Several questions uh, refer to, to a similar topic. Uh, so please let me know if you don't think they were answered. But for example, Berda, Berta uh, Bermudez Tapia asks how likely as, is that these restrictive policies can be reverted if, if Trump is not reelected. Steph Molburn asks, uh, uh, well, sorry, uh, there, there was another question, but El Brimo, uh, whether you envision the wall uh, of uh, the fall of Trump wall, just like the Berlin wall. So I think you answered that uh, question to some extent and the, and the conditions under which that would happen. Um, well, as you saw, like, the, the, the wall is symbolic. Right. Um, you know, let me say just a couple of things to, to that because there's uh, people talk about walls still as if it refers to a physical barrier on the southern border that somehow is going to make America great again. That's kind of like thinking of heaven and hell as geographic locations. Uh, it is not, it doesn't have to do with a physical wall. Um, the US Mexico border is an almost 2,000 mile border that was established in 1853 by treaty after the United States grabbed over half of Mexico in a war of aggression by the US. The first fencing was not built until 1994, 14 miles along the San Diego Tijuana uh, corridor. It had been approved by George H.W. Bush in 1990 and 14 miles were built by 1994. Uh, and then I can give you a whole long litany until the Secure Fence Act of 19, uh, of 2006 uh, that was uh, signed by President George W. Bush, and then uh, how it got completed in 2015 in the Obama administration, at which time, uh, when it was considered completed, according to a GAO report, about 584 miles of fencing had been completed out of that 2,000 mile border. Uh, to that, it is to that that, bump at, that Trump added five miles and then has been repairing 250 something of the, of the rest. None of that stopped immigration. None of that stops contraband. None of that stops all that is supposed to, to, to contraband, uh, is supposed to, uh, uh, to, to achieve. What has been achieved by all these hundreds of executive actions and so on, are the effective sealing off of the border, not by a wall, but by not resettling refugees, by essentially uh, ending asylum in the United States for all intents and purposes, by, uh, by all, the, all the travel bans, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are political decisions and they can be reversed. Uh, so it is indeed a matter of, uh, of taking political action, but for that you need to achieve political power. It's not going to be achieved by a come let us reason together moment um, if, if political power is divided. And, uh, and that's why there has been no comprehensive immigration reform legislation at all since 1990. That's 30 years. Um, that has got to be reversed. It, it can be reversed, whether it can be reversed in, in 25 days, given the, the Kafkaesque moment we're living in, I don't know. Uh, but I've been around long enough to know that uh, I've seen more in, impossible things uh, come true. The, the fall of walls, like the Berlin Wall, are typically steps in the right direction, not the construction of them. You see, related to this and two, two, two related questions to the future, if you want to uh, elaborate a little bit, if, if you think that it's answered, uh, please say so. But one was from Steph Mulburn related to do you th whether you think that this would be the future, uh, that restrictionist policies would continue on the future Republican administrations. And the other one relates, it's a similar question by Christina Su, but on the other hand, asking you, how do you think that the uh, Biden-Harris administration would begin uh, or would uh, tackle immigration. And a related one that I'd like to uh, add there uh, um, just uh, uh, quickly by Tana, Tanya Horowitz that I thought was interesting is whether your thoughts on the Obama administration's handling of immigration issues, um, whether you think that the disparities in harm against immigrants uh, by the Trump versus the Obama administration are, are largely rhetorical or symbolic in nature, or how much you think these differences in policy have had a different impact, which I think is related a little bit to that, if, if you can. Uh, okay, uh, let's, let's try to take them. The first yeah. two were seem, were, seem to be more connected. 
um, in both, you're asking me to kind of predict the future. And I, I remember what Yogi Berra, you know, the Yankee catcher said about the future. He said, predicting is very hard, especially about the future. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I have some, uh, I have some ways of uh, trying to divine the demographic tea leaves, uh, etc. Number one, uh, this country is greatly dependent on immigrant labor, on immigrant contributions, um, uh, in so many ways. It's been the, uh, the, the indispensable ingredient of making America great again, yeah, if, if you will. Um, without immigrants, you will see no future growth um, of the American labor force. You will see population decline. The United States already has, um, the population of the United States has already began uh, that process of decline. And uh, by re the only way to forestall that and the economic growth that comes with an expanding labor force is through immigration. You stop, block, get rid of immigration, you will start seeing what has happened in, been happening in almost all the countries in Europe, in, in Japan, in South Korea, and, and, and so on. Um, you have a pension crisis uh, ahead. The, the baby boomers are still uh, retiring in droves by the, by the day. And the people that are taking care of them in hospitals and et cetera are, are immigrants. Um, uh, many industrial sectors in the U.S. economy, many sectors of the U.S. economy from hospitality, services, and so on are highly dependent on immigrant labor. So whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or what, those um, functional uh, necessities, those structural necessities, uh, are going to have to be confront confronted. A quarter of all counties in the United States are depopulated. A quarter of all counties in the United States are depopulated, including many rural counties especially. Half of all the counties in Vermont are, are depopulating. The, the number one problem that Republican mayors and governors in, in, in these places that are most uh, affected by these depopulation processes are the lack of uh, immigration to help restore and build up uh, the, the labor force. So uh, that is not just a matter of uh, red or blue or, or whether you're a nativist or you're not a nativist. You have to really deal. If you're a nativist, you're still going to need immigrant labor um, for all that I just described. So it's a matter of applying um, reason uh, instead of uh, moral panic stoked by demagogues um, to solutions uh, that are in the national uh, in the national interest and for the greater national good um, so uh, but I mean if you have uh, people that believe in magical thinking I mean just today the FBI uh, arrested a whole bunch of people in Michigan who were going to kidnap the governor of Michigan uh, uh, because uh, Trump had incited them or um, to liberate Michigan and to, I mean, there, there's a big segment of the population out there that are not going to, are not in any kind of mood uh, to kind of reason uh, these problems through. The problems can be reasoned through. And in this audience, uh, um, I mean, there are demographers uh, galore in the United States, economists and, and so on that know what the problems are. Um, there are immigration lawyers that are defending asylum cases, et cetera, that know what the problems are with the immigration courts. Uh, you can put these people together. And a Biden-Harris administration, I mean, take a look at Kamala Harris from my state of California. I've, I've known uh, of Kamala Harris since uh, she started in San Francisco and in the, in the Oakland area. And she went on to become DA and then attorney general for the state of California, and she's the child of immigrants from Jamaica and from India. She's an Asian American, she's an African American. Um, so she's someone that brings uh, not only credibility, but that experience to, th to these kinds of issues. Um, so, uh, but a Harris-Biden administration cannot be effective without having control of Congress. Um, and that is what, without having the political power, in other words, 
uh, to, to, to achieve it. I don't have any worries about their vision. Uh, the question about uh, Obama versus uh, Trump and, and, and back and forth, one of the problems um, facing Obama, and, and this is also goes to what the other two questions raise, is consider this, Obama ran on comprehensive immigration reform. But in September, right in the middle of the 2008 presidential campaign, just uh, six weeks from election day, the markets collapsed, as did my, <laughs> all the money that I had saved for my son's college education and so everything went to uh, with when the bubble burst and the Great Recession started and so on. So Obama had to confront at the, the moment of his inauguration, there were 800 and some thousand jobs a month being lost uh, by the American economy. They had to pass a recovery act. Um, and then he also spent a lot of his political capital on passing a massive undertaking, um, the Affordable Care Act. That was achieved by 2010. During that period of time, Democrats had control of the Senate and the House. They put that on, uh, they put comprehensive immigration reform uh, in abeyance, given all the, 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 the balls that they were juggling. But they lost big time when Republicans took control of the Congress and with the Tea Party revolt and so on in 2010. And Obama was on the defensive for the rest of his term through 2017. Mitch McConnell announced that he would not pass one thing that the Obama administration proposed. And so it was not until after the 2012 election that he finally started using executive orders to pass some things like DACA. Uh, the new president, if there's a new president now in, 20, in, in 2021, will confront something similar. There's now uh, an even worse economic collapse as a result of the global pandemic. Significantly worse uh, in terms of total number of job losses and so on than, than uh, was the case during the Great Recession. Um, until the global pandemic is brought under control, whether through vaccines or what have you, you are not going to achieve that kind of economic recovery at any time soon. In, in fact, even with vaccines, you can foresee a very difficult period ahead, even with control of both houses of Congress and so on. So the new administration is going to be confronted by multiple crises that they're going to have to juggle. And so th that's just the reality, uh, the, the, the baseline that you need to take into consideration when you're starting to hope for the best. Um, so I, the, the thing about the Obama administration is that if you had taken away the Great Recession, if you had taken away Republican control of the Senate and until the last two years of the House of Representatives as well, you might have achieved a lot of things that ended up going by the wayside because of the reality that President Obama confronted at the time. Um, now you try to extrapolate that and see what, if, if you can project the future into what the next four years might, might bring. Uh, and I hope some of the comments that I have made give you some sense of, um, of the kinds of reality conditions that I think we all need to take into account before we start getting too wishful thinking. Thank you. Um, I, there's other uh, points related to, to that last issue uh, in the chat, but before, uh, if we have time, we'll come back to those. Before that, I'd like to give a, a justice as well to some of the questions that were asked before. And also, I think our, uh, our honoree had her hand up, so I'll give her the, uh, the honor of asking the next question before we go into the other ones that were asked before as well. Um, it's really not a question, it's a comment. As a child of immigrant, uh, my daughter and her family went to Ellis Island last year or a couple of years ago and found our, my father's name uh, in the roles of immigrants. We are a country that has had such a mixed history on immigration and I hope that this re the recording of your talk is available to classes in many places. You gave a wonderful uh, summary, a wonderful view of 
how we have not handled things well at many parts of it, times in our history and how we have handled it very well. So my hope today is like yours, that today does not have to be the prologue to the future and that we can see that a more humane world comes to us, that we treat refugees uh, honorably, that we treat immigrants honorably. It is, I feel like I've benefited this country. Uh, I haven't been um, uh, um, detrimental to the world here. So I just wanted to say thank you. And to say that this is beginning of an important conversation that I hope many of us will be able to continue. Thank you. You know, Jane, um, something that immigrants bring to this country, you said you're a child of immigrants. Uh, I, uh, I was born in Havana, Cuba. Yeah. I came here when I was uh, almost 12. Um, so th there's so many people, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, are part of the American narrative. Uh, but immigrants are not just a random sample from their populations of origin. Um, in a world of 7.8 billion or so people, only just over 3% are international migrants who are living outside the countries where they were born. 97% of humanity are stayers. And those who leave their countries to go elsewhere to pursue uh, dreams to, to, for freedom, for all the reasons that, uh, for the children that people leave, are a highly selected group. And uh, the, the oldest people don't immigrate, the poorest people don't immigrate, the sick don't immigrate. Um, the ones who immigrate tend to be intrepid young people. And they come with oodles of hope. Um, being an immigrant uh, almost requires that you be hopeful, even in the middle of an apocalypse. Uh, I consider myself an apocaloptimist, <laughs> so that even when I know that things are going to heck, I remain uh, optimistic. And I do so not out of some kind of magical thinking, just out of my own experience, uh, just like you do uh, from yours. Um, this is eminently doable, especially with all that this country has available to it. But as you have seen, and that was the reason why I focused my talk the way I did, this country is also capable of some very, very dark uh, chapters uh, in its history. But at every time uh, that you fall, we can get up uh, and shake it off and keep going. That is the, the only way, I mean, Nelson Mandela knew that. Uh, that was the, the, at the core of his, of his biography. Um, you got to get up and keep going. You can't just give up and, and let the, the, the evil side uh, win. Thank you so much also for your comments, Jane. Thank you. Um, we're running out of time, but I'd like to, to give justice to at least a, a, a last set of questions that all related in some ways to what to do and how to learn more about the issue in some ways, but also what to do about it, right? Uh, uh, so some people, uh, Charles Boynton asked, for example, are there any data or talking points that you know that are effective at changing the hearts and minds on the topic of immigration? Uh, Michael Rodriguez asks, can you make any comments on what we can do to support movements on immigrant rights? And Kerry Howard asks, do you have any suggested reading to learn more on this subject? relates again to education and activism a little bit. Well, uh, beginning with the last, I have tons of suggested readings uh, and I can't even begin uh, to comment on it, but uh, email me offline um, and let, let's see what I can do uh, with that. Um, with respect to, uh, can you briefly um, Remind me again of the, the first two words. Sure. So it was more about what, uh, if there's any, any uh, type of... Uh, how to reach can, people's people hearts and minds. Yes. And or how to support was, immigrant rights otherwise. Okay. Yeah. As far as hearts and minds, you know, back in the 60s, I remember as a, 
as a college student having a poster that said, a mind is like a parachute. It functions only when open. And um, you need open minds to be able to reach hearts and minds. Um, you need the conditions, you know, for, for that to, to begin to happen. Uh, so much uh, of, of the, the dilemmas and the conflicts and so on are emotion laden and it's, it's, it's hard to reach hearts and minds uh, when what you're doing is going to war uh, against the other side. Um, in Vietnam, American uh, soldiers were not winning hearts and minds when they were torching uh, villages, uh, for, for example. Uh, you have to be wise about how you go about it. And there are many, many ways of doing that, including beginning to appeal to the interests of the people themselves. Um, with regard to mass mobilizations, um, whether it's the civil rights movement or the immigrant rights movements and so on, um, you can't just rely on government action, but on pressure from the outside, from social movements to push toward progressive outcomes. Um, in 2006, you might recall, there were massive marches. Uh, I was present from 7 a.m. Uh, to the evening with my wife in Los Angeles, where a million people showed up uh, to march for immigrant rights and to protest the so-called Sensenbrenner bill that had passed the House of Representatives that would have made felons out of 12 million people with a, uh, with a, with a signature. Um, and it wasn't just in LA, 500,000 marched in Dallas, 300,000 marched in Chicago. Every city in the United States uh, had a tremendous uh, surge, uh, including many undocumented immigrants who themselves uh, put themselves at risk by, by marching uh, them, themselves. One of the things that was learned about those marches at the, the civil rights uh, movement of its time, the immigration rights movement, um, was uh, that you still had to organize politically and vote in order to achieve the kinds of outcomes you wanted, um, which is one reason you saw that, um, that wave of protests kind of uh, diminish. There's one book um, that came out just two years ago called, called Latino Mass Mobilization that I would recommend uh, as a way of understanding the different dynamics that took place in four main air, uh, cities, including Los Angeles and, and New York and, and so on, uh, in, in those 2006 marches, because a lot can be gained from that and incorporate in political strategizing uh, for subsequent uh, mass mobilizations. It's a very complicated question that uh, with the little time that we have, we're about to hit the uh, time limit and I don't want to be like Mike Pence yesterday that kept going on and on and on and on and on beyond the time limit. Even the fly that landed on his head stuck to the time limit. It was on his head for two minutes and three seconds. Um, but not Mike Pence. I don't want to be another Mike Pence, so I'll just be like the fly and, and try to uh, stop at my appointed time. Thank you very uh, much, Thank Ren. you for my, my, uh, accepting my truncated response. Thank you. Um, so be, uh, before we, we wrap up, I just uh, one, one quick thing. Uh, Lauren Hardin from the Immigrant Legal Center of Boulder County reminds me that uh, there's some effort going in Colorado uh, related to the last question uh, to repeal those 2006 uh, restrictive laws in the state, right? And, and it speaks to, to what Ruben was discussing in terms of actions needed to go way past the federal level. But anyway, thank you again very much, Ruben, for, for a great presentation and a great discussion. Sorry we did not get to some of the questions, some related to climate migration. I hope that the questions by Toma, uh, Pio, and um, uh, Jason Borman were, were uh, answered uh, as, as, as they came uh, with the others. And, and sorry we did not get back to the idea of how basically the critique of also democratic administrations and regimes in, in this uh, restrictive policies as well. Anyway, well, thank you very much again for your... Keep in mind that um, in an hour and a half, there's yeah. only so much uh, that you can do. Uh, we have only started here a conversation. Uh, we all need to think about continuing this conversation indefinitely if we're going to achieve anything worth achieving.
Absolutely. And we'll try to provide some of those resources, by the way, in the website where uh, Ruben's uh, talk, video talk, will be posted and where the information from the talk is. Uh, the, the, the link has been, uh, Eileen Brown uh, posted the, the link a few seconds ago, a few minutes ago, in case you're interested in this uh, as well. Um, I'll give the last word to Jane Menken as we <laughs> do in these things. Well, I just want to thank everyone. Um, it's an incredible honor to have your colleagues decide to establish a lecture series in one's honor. It is humbling uh, and I'm grateful to everyone who participated in that and to all of you for being here today. And thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Jane. All right. Thank you again, everybody. And, uh, and vote. Until next time. Vote. And vote. <laughs> early, early. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was my honor. Thank you, Ruben. It was great. Thanks so much. That was terrific.